Welcome to season eight of episode twenty-five. Should I try that again? <laughs> <laughs> that sounded perfectly just fine. Just keep to me. going. <laughs> yeah. Nobody noticed. Okay, we'll just gloss over that. Nobody noticed. It's Tuesday, the twenty-fifth of August, and we're going to discuss what's been happening in the news. I'm Martin, who doesn't know how to introduce a podcast, and joining me this week are Alan. Hello. Laura. Hiya. And welcome back, Mark. Hello, did you miss me? Yes, very yes. much. How are you all? Is that the right answer? <laughs> Is that what we're supposed to say? <laughs> yeah, I, I missed Mark yeah. because nobody was there to back me up about my uh, discussions on Firefox. So, uh, yes, you oh, were Oh, God, don't Mark. start that. Let's get on with the show. Bye. And now it's time for the news. And the first item of news we have today is that GitLab have announced it will be shipping Mattermost, a self-hosted chat application, alongside its flagship code hosting software. Mattermost is presented as an alternative to Slack, a software-as-a-service chat tool. Has anybody used Slack? No. No. <laughs> no. But I, I know people who do. Yeah, same here. Ooh, that was said with a bit of disdain there, Mark. No, no, no. I was, I was just saying cautiously, as in I don't want to claim that I know more than I know. I've seen it, and I know people who've used, like, I know a, a, an open source project who use it as their sort of um, real-time chat media. A collaboration tool. Yes. I've been to the website. <laughs> Did you I once in? said Slack, yes. <laughs> I used to know someone Martin? called Slack. So. Um, no, I know nothing about it. What, 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 is, what is Slack, and why would I use it? It's like 21st century IRC. You know, it lets you do nice full color emoticons, emojis, and transfer files. It's like, a, you know, like a IRC on that someone's put a bit of a bit of paint on and made it look nice and usable for normal people. But the main so, difference in terms of the architecture being is that it's not a distributed federated service. It's a software as a service hosted by a company. Right. Uh, okay. So it's like IRC for hipsters then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So if I was an IRC loving hipster who liked it on the web and I had open source sensibilities, I, I'm guessing that Mattermost is the tool that I would want to use. I think so. You know, a lot of people use, um, you know, it seems to be super popular to use uh, GitHub at the moment. And the kind of people who use GitHub are the kind of people in general who would be happy using a proprietary tool like Slack. Um, whereas the kind of people who would be inclined to want to host their free software projects on a free software platform like GitLab would probably want to use a free software uh, collaboration tool like Slack. So, uh, sorry, like Mattermost. So it makes sense for those two things to be kind of shipped together. Um, and it's good to have a, a bit of a more usable uh, chat interface, I guess, because... Um, What's wrong with IRC? IRC? Well, I don't IRC. understand, Laura. IRC is a bit of a, a hurdle to get over, really, isn't it? Yeah. Is it really? I, I mean, I don't think, we I just mean, point people at a chat window on a web browser and it yeah, just does Yeah, but if, you want, if you want, like, nice features with IRC, like being able to have it, like, send you a notification whenever anyone, um, like, mentions Joins you. the room. Or stuff like that, then you have to have it, like, you have to have IRC running on a server all the time and, like, SSH into it whenever you want to chat to someone. Right. Which, you know, is fine for people like me who run their own server, um, crucially. But for, you know, for when you're just like trying to onboard someone into your software project and you're saying, here, you know, we chat over here when you need some help or whatever, or when we're having a meeting, if you can just point them at a web page and it's a nice, right. and not shiny say interface. you have to apt get this and, yes. and yeah. slash yeah. server that yeah. and yeah. enable the it Java add on for your browser. <laughs> And then, yeah, and then work out how to log in and yeah. how to... It, it's a bit like Linux in the old days. You couldn't just do something. You have to do other things in order to do something. Right. That's my experience. But the good news it. is that Slack and GitHub are horrible proprietary software and GitLab and Mattermost are lovely, lovely free software. And that's good. Yay! Right. Yeah, it is good. And I think GitLab are being very um, clever about how they're positioning themselves against GitHub. So all power to their elbow. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I've not heard that phrase before. <laughs> <laughs> 
So IBM is expanding support for Linux on mainframes with a few new initiatives that they've announced, uh, including plans for an Ubuntu distribution. Well, this is fantastic because we've got someone from IBM and somebody from Ubuntu here. So clearly the authority on this topic. Go. Right. So, <laughs> so it's a pretty it box. really yeah. sexy. It's a nice box. I'll give it that. <laughs> it's very good. Have a look at the photo. Mm. It's like, wow. It is a really it nice is. looking box. And it's inside, it's just computers one. like any like any other. You know, they're just bits of you know boards and chips and things yeah. soldered together and fans and discs and know, stuff. It's not really any different to anything else with a so, nice box on the outside. So when we like say the outside, an Apple laptop, <laughs> the outside looks like a stealth fighter. Though who would want yes, that in your that's, data center? That's it. Yes, that's cool. and they named data after penguins. People. The Linux what? One Emperor and the Linux One Rock Copper. Oh, yeah. cunning! Linux, you know. So, so and go on, when, when we talk about a mainframe these days, do we just mean one these very days. big server in instead of a cluster of smaller servers? Is that is that what we mean, or is there something like fundamental about how these computers work that's not just like a regular server? Hardware-wise, yes, I think so. Like you can run lots and lots of virtual machines on yeah, a mainframe, but you can do that on a cluster of normal servers do they still yeah, have I'd... thermiodic valves and paper tape <laughs> uh, oh. i like the juxtaposition there of mark with his really i don't know what a mainframe is and uh <laughs> <laughs> mark martin with his hmm does it have valves mm, let me like my pipe well i used, to, got lots I used of robots to work on mainframes things. years ago you know <laughs> that's how it right. was the thing is we i work upstairs from mainframes and they're, they're they're quite clever these days they've got lots of blue leds and things <laughs> the thing is my my experience of mainframes is we used to have um a mainframe hard disk propping open the door of my computer room in when i was doing a levels and it was like that would work about sort of two feet in diameter and that's all yeah. i know about mainframes they had big so hard disks selling- back in the day the big selling point about this particular announcement yeah. is that there are plenty of places where you can run your workloads on Ubuntu in the cloud. And Ubuntu is very popular in the cloud, be it Amazon, HP, or, you know, on OpenStack or on your own hardware. Um, but up until now, it's not been possible if you're an IBM shop and you, you buy IBM hardware and you run all your, your workloads on IBM stuff. It's not been possible to run those things that you might run on Ubuntu elsewhere on your own stuff on Ubuntu. So you'd, you'd yeah. have to run a different distro or a different setup completely to run the same workload. Whereas one of the benefits of Ubuntu is you can run the same workload on any cloud using the same tools. Mm-hmm. Um, and now, if you've got your own hardware in your own data center and it's one of these giant robot-looking uh, massive computers from IBM, then you can throw vast workloads at these giant pieces of equipment, which is great. Cool. Yep. And I think they're um, good for energy efficiency as well, over the cluster thing you, you were asking, Martin. Mm. Mark. Oh, okay. Oh, I suppose, yeah, because you're running one big machine rather than lots with each with their own PSU and whatever. Okay, that makes mm, sense. I think so. Cool. Well, uh, segueing neatly is some news about another um, older hardware architecture. The Commodore Amiga 1000 is 30 years old. And that was a Why? that was a great machine in its day, and probably what, what sort of spec was the Commodore Amiga One Thousand? Oh, you know, for, for the people who are young and impressionable, like Mark, <laughs> what, what was an Amiga One Thousand? <laughs> yeah. um, Six forty by four hundred resolution screen. Whoa. I can't remember what chip it had in it though. Um, Is it, was it a sixty sixty oh four or motor, something like that? It was a Motorola, wasn't it? Was it a sixty eight thousand? Yeah, it would have been one of the generations of sixty eight thousand, like yeah, sixty oh four two or something. Like, yeah. yeah. I think the Amiga 500, which was our family computer when I was young, had uh, we upgraded the RAM, and I think it had half a megabyte. Whoa! And then we then we installed <laughs> an external RAM pack, and it had a megabyte. Wow! But so Amazing. so did the did the if if the Amiga 1000 is a th- is thirty years old, did the Amiga 500 come after the Amiga 1000? It did, and it wasn't that much after was either. It? it was yeah, yeah. It was it was only a couple of years, wasn't it? Yeah. Interesting numbering yeah. scheme there. <laughs> numbering schemes were odd in those days because Acorn did backwards uh, numbering like that as whereas well. Whereas now yeah. Windows has an obvious logical numbering scheme. What, of yeah. copy everyone else? No, you know, 
one, two, three, XP, ME. <laughs> of course. Eight, nine, I, 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 I used to lust after the, the Amiga that my friend had because it just looked so much better and it did so much. You know, the multi, that was the first place that I ever saw graphical multitasking on a, on a, on a, um, on a computer in someone's house. Yeah. He had, um, he had the desktop up. I can't even remember what the desktop was called. Workbench. Workbench. Workbench and yeah. had a bunch of BBC emulators running oh, different wow. games inside <laughs> uh, in Windows and just moving them around, moving them on top of each yeah. other. And that was like amazing wow. for me. I, I just couldn't believe. I think I was about 18 at the time. I just couldn't believe, you know, wow, yeah. you can get computers yeah. at home that can do this. Yeah, because I mean, um, I, I remember playing all sorts of games on it when I was little and then like, growing up and finding out these games were also on other computers at the time and seeing screenshots of like Commodore 64 ports and just thinking, wow, they just look terrible because the Amiga graphics <laughs> were really nice at the time, but everything else was just awful. Well, yes, because they had considerably less RAM, <laughs> so they didn't have a lot of room to store 8-bit colour for every single pixel, whereas yeah. the Amiga had, you know, uh, lots more storage and, and hardware-accelerated... Uh, sprites and uh, audio it was it was real it was a real gaming you know machine. yeah it was, it was the only it was, it was the only computer that could really um do an arcade conversion and be you know faithful to the original the right arcade. colors yeah yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. true um mm, and as as we you know we're talking excitedly you know fondly looking back at the amiga and it made, it made an impression on lots of people and you can still buy amigas today um, the Amiga 1 X1000 and the Amiga 1 500 are available today and they're now based on um, PowerPC architecture. Hmm. And uh, they run uh, Amiga OS uh, 4.1 or um, if you're looking for um, a powerhouse operating system as an alternative, <laughs> you could uh, go for the uh, Ubuntu Mate PowerPC port and uh, there's several people in the Ubuntu anyway, Mate moving community on. Yeah, actively <laughs> running on the Amiga 1s. <laughs> nice. I'd be quite impressed if we can do an episode without mentioning Marte one week. <laughs> oh, come on. Well, I could go on holiday again if you like. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would do it. No, somebody's bound to mention it still. No. Mark. Next up, uh, Mozilla has announced that it will be changing the way Firefox add ons are implemented. Future add ons will use a new API called Web Extensions, which is largely compatible with Chrome and Opera's browser extension API. Uh, the new API is JavaScript centric, meaning that uh, Zool extensions are being deprecated. And sorry, I was thinking of Ghostbusters. <laughs> yeah, and uh, a new signing policy will be phased in over the next few releases of Firefox. So after I think it's version forty-two, any branded Firefox uh, release will only support extensions signed by Mozilla. Hmm. That last point raises a question. Go what on. about? distributions that ship firefox extensions as packages in the archive are you no longer going to be able to do that now Ooh, um, interesting question you probably can if you have some kind of partnership agreement with mozilla which what, that uh, a, sec a, a key a, a, a key signed by their master key that you can use or just get them uh, to sign it as part of your i don't know yeah uh, mm, yeah that's a good question i don't know how that would work that's interesting. Well, I guess that's why they're phasing it in over a few releases, so there's time for this to be sorted out. Hmm. So what was Zool? Um, XUL, uh, XML user user interface language or something. Um, it's basically a um, an XML -E type thing which defines the interface elements in um, Firefox and Thunderbird and one other application, I think. Um, and then you use JavaScript to do all the sort of logic. Okay. I'm I'm not at all bothered about this uh, change of API for the extensions because I use so few extensions as it is that they're available for Chrome and yeah. Firefox. So it's, this isn't going to impact me as far as I can see. This but all seems like a as very a user, good idea. As, yeah, as a user, but can can do it, any of you use extensions that you think might be impacted by this change? Well, what's what's their definition of you know why? What will they assign, and are there any limitations on what they will sign? I think you know, it's mainly just. I think it's mainly to, to avoid like like adware and malicious stuff, rather than stuff they don't like. Hmm. That seems to okay. be the focus of the 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 blog post, anyway. 
mm. which is great because I have seen things like Superfish creeping into browser extensions of late. So, um, yeah, I welcome right. that. Um, but even yeah. that even happens on you know, on other browsers like Chrome. There are extensions which will do something useful, but then nag you constantly about something or put their watermark on you know things that they do and stuff. And obviously, they want to get paid, so they're going to nag you to get you to pay for the extension because the vast majority of them are completely free. Um, mm. And I I wonder if that that will reduce in Firefox, but given it still happens in Chrome, I can't see that it will. So I still think there will be malicious, in inverted commas, um, extensions, just not necessarily malicious in some ways. Hey-ho. Um, it's been noted by various technology news sites this week that a story about airport baggage handling uh, posted late last year included a picture of the master keys used by TSA officials. The master keys can be used by US authorities to open luggage locks without the owner's key or code. It's possible that duplicate keys can be made using the photos as a reference, meaning anyone could undetectably open luggage with TSA-approved locks. Hmm. Could they, though? Oops. And how would they get access to your luggage, anyway? Where where would your luggage be left that the TS that, that isn't, like, while you're heading on holiday and so would be in the custody of baggage reclaim or, you know, the baggage handlers at the airport? Who would be doing that that's not um, the TSA? Someone who wants to steal things from your bag or sneak stuff into your bag yeah somebody somebody or someone pose, someone yeah, who's, who's not authorized to, to use the tsa's master keys but does have access to your bag in the baggage handling area hmm yeah okay i was thinking you you know that's the only place i would think it goes out of your control is the second you hand it over to them and they mm. always you know interrogate you that you haven't <laughs> taken something in there for someone else and you know, you fill the you fill the luggage. Yeah. You know, yourself well, in that case, that. if if I mean, if you're if you're happy with that, then you know you don't need to put a lock on it at all. Right, and I generally don't. Fair enough. Well, you're not meant to, really, are you? Unless you've got the TSA thing. Well, in America, you're not. No, the rest of the world is okay. Yeah. But if you're traveling in America, then um, yeah, they will destroy your lock if they decide to. I'd, yeah, and they do that anyway. Um, but I, di I did wonder if that they were maybe just fake keys, but then I guess someone would have said that by now. Possibly. Or maybe yeah. they're just not saying it and letting people make the mistake and try opening bags with these keys they've made and failing. <laughs> well, thin. Or succeeding, because you can just go to the shops and buy TSA locks. Yeah. Uh, the padlocks. And so yeah. you could test this yourself without you like any, any suspicion whatsoever. 3D print yourself some keys. Eat them afterwards. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yep. That exists, doesn't it? 3D printed food. Anyway, carry yes. on. <laughs> so, uh, Linux is 24 today. Wow. Happy birthday, Ray. Linux. Is this since the announcement that I've made a little art piece of software? It's not going to be big and impressive like yeah. Unix or anything. That's but it. Linux yeah. did. That's the right. one. Yeah. Not Wasn't big and professional Christmas? like GNU. No, it was in August, specifically the 25th. Oh, all right. Uh, as in today. <laughs> That'd be why it's today. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Laura. It's okay. Yeah. yeah and, uh, uh, so, yeah. It's had an the impact end of the on my life. I think it is. Yeah. Yes. And we've got some community news. Uh, first up, GTK is difficult. Is it? Agreed. Comment, discuss. <laughs> What's all that about then? Oh, somebody, somebody who's a not, not a developer who um, I think they're being maintains a bit, um, the Terminator code was having a yeah. bit of a complaint about how GTK is hard. Yeah. Well, Terminator is great. In fact, having read that article, I've actually updated to the um, Terminator nightlies, and um, there's some big improvements there. I'm really looking forward to uh, the next uh, stable release. But I'm using the nightlies, and it works just fine. But I think he was being a bit modest, saying that he's not a developer, because if you're maintaining the code for a yeah. project like that, which is actually it's it's quite complex in places, um, I I think you can call yourself a developer quite happily. 
But I do mm. agree. So it's just it's just GTK that's making him feel bad about himself. Yeah, he said oh. he said it was only the GTK parts that ever caused him any angst, or uh, as he puts it, banging his head against the wall. Um, mm. And yeah, I still struggle with GTK, but then again, I don't de- develop against it often enough for it to be second nature to me and maybe maybe that's the uh, the similar thing that if you're not using it every day and you're not fluent then it's difficult to sort of pick up and put down Mm -hmm. Mm. in other news yay unity overlay scroll bars are going you sounded very excited there why why what's what why well, day to day it doesn't affect me because I actually went and Googled and found out how to remove them anyway, so I don't use them at all on either of my laptops. Huh. I did not know you could remove them. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> to me. I use it as a stock desktop, so I didn't I didn't really uh So the Unity overlay scroll bars are the things that kind of live half inside and half outside the window where yeah. when you move your mouse to the edge of the window the a tab appears and you can drag that up and down. Yes, mm-hmm. to yeah, scroll that's up. right. Yeah. Yep. Or you can just yep. use a scroll wheel. Or that as well. Yep. Yeah. Well, I use the scroll wheel. I think it was partly because um, to shoot up and down the screens, you can click on the actual scroll bar background, typically, mm-hmm. in Windows. And um, I don't know whether it was because of missing that capability or whether it just really, really annoyed me. And eventually I found out how to turn them off and did. Mm. Ooh, so they're be... going to revert to I say they we are going to revert <laughs> to uh, the gnome uh, upstream scroll bars, right? That's yeah, correct. I assume they're just normal scroll bars, but I don't know. They're they're not quite normal scroll bars. Um, I oh, I I know this because <laughs> I've I've adopted them for the GTK three applications in Ubuntu Mate because it's easier to sort of follow the upstream on this than try and reinvent things. So the way they work is they have a a thin um, coloured indicator where the scroll bar would be uh, to show yeah. your progress down that you know applications window, and as you move the mouse toward that uh, thin indicator it expands to a full-size traditional scroll bar so it takes up less space initially if you're not yes. using it, if you're using the mouse wheel and then as yes. you head towards it it grows knowing that you want to try and hit it correct that sounds right. sensible yeah nice so this i think the rationale for this is to reduce maintenance burden in patching out yeah. the scroll bars when every time there's an update from upstream gnome yeah that's right and uh continuing the uh the effort to promote ubuntu mate if you want to try this out ubuntu mate 1510 beta 1 has this feature enabled super what's next uh if you're feeling creative you could submit some of your hard done work into the ubuntu free culture showcase Ah. which is the place where you can submit artwork music videos yes. um which could then be used in the next ubuntu distribution next version of ubuntu yeah as I, the sort of default desktop and things i looked back and um i think the last time we did this was three years ago the last time oh, wow. we, we we had the free culture showcase like competition contest like you know uh, process um mm. and uh yeah so the the content in there hasn't changed much since 2012 um the lts uh release i think oh wow and it's um yeah it's just a little uh i think there's a little piece of music and there's a there's a little video with a animated ubuntu logo in there and um the this was um driven by a member of the community nathan haynes who said he'd like to rejuvenate this and so uh, we said, yeah, have at it, do it. Um, and also uh, they're looking for uh, backgrounds as well um, for the the desktop and the phone. So, cool. uh, yeah. Um, this is we'll brilliant. Link to it. We'll link to the if, um, wiki page. If only there was a free culture and open source conference where somebody could do a talk or a presentation about this and, you know, try and, you know, speak to like-minded individuals and drum up some enthusiasm to contribute some content. That would just be brilliant. Mm. Oh, well. If only that kind of, if only that kind of conference were available. I know. I know. And it's a far enough away distance that we could go on a road trip to get there. (laughs) (laughs) So what are we talking about here? Ogcamp. Of course we're talking yeah. about Ogcamp. Of course. <laughs> Ogcamp is when? October. October. Specifically. Brilliant. 31st. Uh, 
and November the 1st. Okay. Halloween weekend. Indeed. Yeah. Uh-oh. Ooh. And it's in Liverpool. Yep. And yep. we're going. Yeah. We are. We are. <laughs> We should mention it's uh, at the John Lennon School of Art and Design, which is part of Liverpool John Moores University and is the same place it's been the last two times it was in Liverpool. Yep. Excellent. It's a great venue and yep. loads of space to spread out and uh, exhibition space and uh, plenty of rooms. Lovely staff. Yes, lovely staff. Plenty of rooms for people to give talks in and there's some space outside if it's not raining. Uh, the space is also there if it is raining. Um, it's just yeah. wet sit around and have pizza or a uh, picnic or whatever and uh, yeah and good fun and you're walking distance from the liverpool city center yeah so you can go shopping or down to albert docks and it's all very pretty it's also free did we mention that it's free oh yes and of course you can pay for a ticket if you want to and you become don't a sponsor to. that's right and I'm assuming it's the usual format of a track of programme that's scheduled and then the rest is on conference? I believe so, yes. Yes, I think, I think it's so. semi-unconference, yeah. 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 So yes. Yes. Apologies if we all sound vague. None of us are organised in the uh, yes. organisation. Usually at least so. one of us is involved in organising yeah, it. Yeah, it's like year, the first year. Um, mm. after, after doing most of the work last year, I decided to take a year <laughs> off. Um, so and none of us, the rest of us do it. Yeah, so the, um, the unstoppable Dan Lynch... And the crew chief, Les Pounder, are mainly responsible this year um, yep. with a, a, a band of followers um, who you can read more about on Dan's blog post, which is where we're getting all the information for this. Um, yes. Um, so uh, and t- so the, the, the point of the, the talks thing is if you've got a talk which you want to give, then bring it to a camp and give it. And for the first time ever, I've got two ideas. <gasps> wow. Fantastic. Are you going to give talks? talks? Well, if I get them written beforehand, yeah. Mm. Terrific. And for those yeah, of you that want to find out more and buy your tickets, you can go to ogcamp.org and buy your tickets. And I think that website can, hold on, will be up. Let me check this before we, we finish. It has the tickets on the homepage at the moment. It does, yeah. yeah. Oh, you, can, you can also go to og.camp. Oh, right. <laughs> oh, right. <laughs> wow. Awesome. These new TLDs. What fun. And that... Dan is working on the Ogcamp website at he the moment is. to provide a lot more information. Yeah, super stuff. But and, we'll also link uh, to his blog post, so you can read. If that. you're outside of the UK, Go don't anywhere. let that like put Dan. you off. You should you should try and find a way to make your way to Ogcamp because it's a, a great friendly event. Yeah. Awesome. Is that all the community news and events? I think so. Yep. Well, I just oh sorry. I just thought we should have had a, we should have had a getting touch sting there. Oh, we should. Never mind. <laughs> oh well, everybody, get in touch. Show at ubuntupodcast.org. Thanks, Laura. Thank you, Laura. No worries. I think I'm right in saying that's oh. all for episode 25. Now we'll be back next week when we'll be we'll be discussing the impact that uh, the Google Chrome browser has had on the browser market, and we'll be bringing you some command line love. Hooray. And relax. Yeah. And relax, yes. Breathe. <laughs> oh, glad to be back. <gasps> we'll see you next week. Yes. I hope, hope so. Yes. Yeah. Ta-ra. Ta-ta. Bye-bye. Now. Bye-bye. <laughs>